Most of the players must have been disappointed. While it had been somewhat difficult for them in the beginning, it quickly became almost too easy and ended far sooner than anyone had expected. The only person who probably predicted a short battle was Ulsic. He was probably patting himself on the back for thinking up all the restrictions he had placed on the monsters. As the players headed off, the remainder of our army had already begun marching. We were taken along, roundabout route that would reach the inn several minutes after the players did. If all went well, it would be the best chance to show how well the monsters understood tactics. While the monster leader took the long path, leading the way, I knew I would regret it if I missed seeing the players arrive at the inn. After passing my intentions on to Hardjil, who told me to make sure it didn't ruin the surprise, I raced off towards the inn, taking the most direct route I could take. I kept to the woods as I got near the inn, and was not surprised to stumble into several monsters, who were hiding as best as they could. They were all watching the inn, waiting for the right moment. First, one or two players entered the inn, long before anyone else. There would be a brief moment of motion that we could see through the windows, but then nothing. Finally, the town army appeared, a small group ahead of everyone else. This group went straight into the inn, possibly intending to have a nice refreshing drink. There was a scream, followed by several others. The monsters must have emerged from their hiding spaces and were now moving towards all the entrances. The poor players in the group he had entered first must have received quite a shock, and only one managed to escape. The man ran screaming, genuinely scared, and the town army reassembled outside the inn, ready to reclaim it. They first tried to focus on getting through the main entrance, but they knew even better than we did how foolish that plan was. The players had defeated the inn time and time again, and knew that two people, with replacements, could defend a single entrance against almost any number of opponents. They must have assumed that our entire army was inside the inn, which meant we could defend the main entrance for ours. They decided to adopt the strategy the monsters typically used, to launch a continuous attack on all the entrances, in hopes that one entrance would eventually run out of replacement. As we had predicted, they separated into smaller groups, and I saw that Ulsic had five of his squad members go with him, leaving only two to guard him. It was the black scale warrior with the two-handed sword, along with one I haven't met yet. He didn't look particularly impressive, his armour painted a dull grey, and even the axe he carried looked barely functional. It had two large, wide blades about two feet long, and the entire weapon was no longer than a typical sword. Even so, I had heard enough from Vlaine about him, enough to know that he was probably the strongest of the seven. The group began attacking all entrances, and once they were sufficiently spread out, shouts started to come out of the woods. Monsters were running forward from all around, and the players started to scream and panic. They were defenceless. Without a shield wall in front of them, the mages were easy targets, and once they were down, the players could no longer heal. I saw the grip containing Tiburon fall rapidly apart, sandwiched between the inn filled with monsters and the ones that had emerged from the woods. I almost felt bad for his imaginary sweetheart, but there were more important things for me to worry about. Even as the monsters around me ran out to join what was starting to look like a massacre, I remained behind, waiting for my chance. The nobles were confused, with some of them still intending to try and get into the inn, while others seemed keen on retreating back. The disorganised players began to act on their own, forming small clusters to try and protect their mages. Finally, I saw a great moment. The hammer-wielding plateware had separated from his grip and had started sprinting towards where Ulsic was. I ran out of the woods, intending to cut him off. He stopped me from a distance and changed direction. When I was within his range, his hammer swung out, forcing me to dodge backwards to avoid it. He swung again, but then I threw an ice spell at him, forcing him to dodge back before he could complete the swing. He probably knew that I had tried to get him, or one of the other seven, into a one-on-one -on -one match so that my ice spells would be more effective but it didn't look as if he was judging me negatively for my tactic. He whipped his hammer at me again, and I blocked with my sword, not realising his intention. He allowed the hammerhead to slide down the back of the blade towards my hand, and with a sudden yank, managed to pull the sword out of my grasp before I knew what had happened. He tried to follow this up with more attacks, but I blocked his hammer easily with my arms before leaping and rolling to where my sword had fallen. Without standing, I quickly spun around, hoping to catch him in the legs with my sword. He had barely managed to jump away in time. With a bit of distance between us, I tried another ice spell, but he dodged it again. Wondering how these bastards had managed to get so good at dodging spells, 
when I'm pretty certain their historical recreation society didn't have them. I tried another one as he closed the distance between us. He twisted out of the way of the spell and continued the spin, bringing his hammer flying towards my side. Blocking it with my left hand, I tried to strike at him with a one-handed swing, but he leapt backwards and out of the way. He didn't create too much distance, however, making sure to try and keep me within range of his hammer. While his weapon was heavier and slower than mine, his reach was much longer, keeping me from getting any decent strikes. I knew that this couldn't continue for very long before someone else decided to join in, and I could only hope it was one of my allies and not his. We continued to exchange blows, neither of us managing to get a single hit in. Then he tried it again. After I managed to block another one of his horizontal swings, he allowed the head of his hammer to lower down to the hilt of my sword. Almost insulted that he had tried the same trick twice, I pulled my sword to the side, unhooking it from his hammer. He stepped forward, thrusting the head of the hammer into my chest for 10 points of damage. I had been stupid to think that he wouldn't treat this hammer pole arm as a thrusting weapon, but I had no time to further regret my action. He swung in earnest now, invigorated by his successful hit. I struggled to keep blocking his attacks, his hammer a mere blur as he struck again and again, the momentum of the battle entirely his. As I retreated backwards, he followed relentlessly, until I managed to back up all the way into the woods. He stood at the edge, looking uncertain, but entered after I tried to pull a beanbag from my pocket. I led him further in, glad to see that he had to restrict the motion of his attacks to keep his long pole arm from hitting any trees or branches. My sword was not restricted as much, and I began to take the initiative, managing to land a hit on him after I had taken cover behind a tree. He was smart enough to know that this was not the best place to fight me, but it was much too late now. He struggled inside of the forest, trying to keep me at bay, until a second hit convinced him to take his chances. The moment I had been waiting for, he leapt back and turned to run out of the woods. My ice spell hit him, squarely in the back once again. Without waiting to see just how good he could fight without moving his legs, I began to strike at them, chipping away at his HP eight points at a time. He dropped to his knees after several hits, his hammer dropping down in front of him in frustration. He then called out to me, asking if I really thought I had won the match. Walking past him, I didn't have an answer. The thought of looting him crossed my mind, as did the thought of dealing him a finishing blow. But I kept walking, not in the mood to do either. The battlefield had changed dramatically since I had last seen it. The small clusters of players had joined together into one large mass, and they were slowly edging their way into one of the main roads. There were bodies of dead players everywhere. Most of them were opting to sit rather than lay down and have the chance of being trampled. Ulsic was casting spells in earnest, killing any monster that came near him. The players were gathering behind him, using him as a form of shelter from the storm of monsters. I moved forward onto the battlefield making my way towards him. While still a good distance away from him, I stopped to watch him. Nothing about his actions made any suggestion as to whether or not he had any phylactery with him. He didn't seem particularly interested in the heading in, so I could at least rule out that it was there. We needed to know where it was, or at least what it was. Without that information, there was no way for us to win this battle. Even if we killed every player other than Ulsic, as long as he remained in this world, he would never allow House Cerberus to exist especially now that we've waged war against him. Realising that staring at him wouldn't let me read his mind, I moved closer, until I was certain he had seen me. Right now, what I needed was a chance, a chance that his phylactery was either on him or somewhere nearby. Beyond this, I could only pray that Ulsuk was as dumb as I thought he was, hoping that beyond hope, that the plan that had popped into my head, I gave Ulsuk the biggest smile I could muster. With a few words to his two guards, the black scaled man started heading towards me. Before he had taken even a few steps, as loudly as he could, I shouted at Ulsic, saying that I had stolen and destroyed his phylactery. It happened. I could almost not believe that such a simple plan had worked out so perfectly. Ulsic and his two guards all stopped, and for the briefest of moments all looked in one direction. At first I was confused, until I realised why the black scaled man had looked down. He had looked at his sword. The high quality weapon would be the perfect item for a phylactery that could devour souls, with the phylactery being something that could only be destroyed in a very specific manner. He wouldn't even have to worry about shatter spells, and though its simple design didn't even hint that it was magical, that only served its master better. Ulsic laughed, shouted that I had no idea what the phylactery even was, 
and that there was no chance I ever would. Knowing that I needed to confirm my suspicions, I realised I would have to once again rely on his stupidity. Shouting again, I said that I had replaced the man's sword while he slept, and the one that he was carrying now was a fake. Not even considering the sheer absurdity of what I had just said, also gave a look of utter panic, something I delighted in seeing. He turned to the black scaled man, who quickly replied that it couldn't have happened since he had slept with a sword in his hand. It dawned on Ulsic what had just happened, before he could say anything however. We were all distracted by the sudden addition of the remaining part of the monster army into the battlefield. They had come up the way the players had been moving to retreat. The monster leader in front and looking particularly fierce, the players lost hope. With a number of players who had died, the monsters now had the numerical advantage and with no place for the players to run and all of them surrounded, we also had the strategic advantage. If the battle continued, with most of the players' mages being dead, it would only be a matter of time before they were crushed. Ulsic, his frustration and rage having built up so much in the last few moments, began throwing instant kill spells at the monsters, hitting two players in the process. They fell to the ground, screaming angrily, but Ulsic didn't seem to even notice. He was planning on killing every monster all by himself, and he had the stats to do it. Then, just as the players could do nothing but lament over their inevitable death, one of the doors to the inn swung open, and an old wizard shouted towards the players that the monsters had vacated the inn. There was a great, unified shout as the remaining players started to push their way towards the inn. The monsters between them and the building moved out of their way. A smart move, considering how ferociously they wanted to reach safety. Once they managed to all get inside, they positioned guards at each door, Flynn being among them, his old wizard costume as ridiculous as ever. The players would probably be rather unhappy to see a pile of corpses upstairs that included healers they desperately could use, and right now what we wanted them to be was as miserable as possible. The monster army moved to circle the inn, and once positioned, simply stood, an unnerving sight for the players inside. Usually in the scripted battles where the players would always win, the monsters would just keep attacking the inn until the players had killed enough of them. Now, however, the monsters had nothing forcing them to make suicidal attacks. Rather than being safe within the inn, the players were trapped inside of it. I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of people at the LARP who thought that Vlain's old wizard NPC was actually his character. He stood confidently at the door, while the players who were guarding it with him glanced around nervously. I don't think it's fair to call Vlain a sleeper agent, since he hadn't and wouldn't do anything against the town. He was just a necessary player, a person who would do things so that the plot would advance in a reasonable fashion. As Lith and Selina moved towards the main entrance, it was Vlain who announced to the other players inside the inn that an envoy was approaching in order to discuss terms. As Ulsic moved forward, Vlain reasoned with him, convincing them that he wasn't the best person to discuss anything right now. Another man stepped out one of the heads of the noble houses. While he didn't look very pleased, he at least seemed a lot calmer than Ulsic was at the moment. Selina spoke first, saying that while they talked, the monsters would move back, so that the players would have the chance to save their people on the battlefield, many who were still within the 15 minute limit. Flynn and several other players went out, checking the people to see if they were still alive and dragging them back into the inn if they were. After several people had been saved, Lith began his speech, he started by saying that many people had died who didn't need to, and that if they all had only joined sides with House Cerberus at first, only one person would have to die. He said that Ulsic had given House Cerberus no choice, and that it was either kill him or die. It didn't excuse them for all the killing that had occurred, but the players were not blameless themselves. They had harboured an evil lich, and had chosen to fight for him. Now, he said they all had one final choice, to either cast out Ulsic, or to die for him by the hands of the monster army. The monsters began to shout and scream at these words, and Lith and Selina walked away from the inn, giving them a chance to discuss what to do next. This would now be Vlain's time to shine. I could only imagine what he said. At this point, I think it would be rather easy to convince everyone that throwing Ulsic out was the only right move. We all watched the inn from where we stood, waiting to see what their response would be. As we waited, I told the other members of House Cerberus about the sword phylactery. They all remained stoic. We needed to see the players answer, to see how they felt about Ulsic. Sounds of commotion came from then, and indistinct shouts could be heard coming from inside it. Finally, after several minutes, Ulsic stepped out alone, looking furious. <laughs> <laughs>
Lith walked closer to him, but kept a good distance away all the same. Ulsic simply said that he was now alone, and he wanted to know if we thought all these monsters would be enough to kill him. Lith struggled, trying to make up his mind whether or not to say his part. He had disagreed with this part of the plan, and probably had only agreed because he had doubted we would make it this far. He looked back at me, and then at Hargill, frowning. In truth, there was a part of me that also didn't want Lith to speak, but the monster leader wanted Ulsic defeated utterly, and sending him wave after wave of monsters until he finally died would be a glorious death he didn't deserve. The last part of our plan had been created almost at a whim, under the notion that we would only proceed with it if everything had gone well. It was something that the monster leader had thought up, and I had agreed with it in regards to principles, but not necessarily practicality. We had finally managed to get this far, and the final stage of the plan had a large chance to ruin all of our efforts so far. Still, it was a matter of principles. It was a matter of making sure the complete and total justice was delivered. Lith seemed to understand. Turning to Ulsic, he said that this was a private feud between our two houses. House Cerberus had the right to challenge House Ulsic, and we had decided to use that right. Ulsic looked confused for a moment, then furious, until finally he smiled. A disgusting, miserable smile. Nodding his acceptance, he began to move forward. But Lith called out to him, telling him to stop. The duel would take place within the field before the castle, and that Ulsic was free to take any member of his house who were willing to join him. House Cerberus would expect him within the half hour. Lith walked away, not wanting for Ulsic's response. Hargill and Selena joined up with him, heading down the road. I stayed behind for a little while, watching. The monsters began to pull away disappearing into the woods around the inn. Many seemed pleased with themselves, having pushed the players into such a state with nothing but tactics and their own fighting skills. Others, however, seemed to understand that the battle wasn't over yet. Though their part was over, they now had to place their faith into High Cerberus, as nothing would be settled as long as Ulsic lived. Ulsic stood outside for a little while, not looking at anything in particular. Finally, he started to laugh. A maniacal laugh that couldn't be produced by a sane man before rushing back into the inn. I continued to watch the inn, indulging in a moment of hesitation. We were not finished yet, but the gravity of the final stage of our plan hadn't seemed real until then. It would be perhaps my final battle at this LARP. A certainty of how Cerberus lost this challenge. A few minutes of the precious half hour passed, and no one came out of the inn. As I wondered what Ulsic was planning, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I was surprised to see Vlaine, not in his old wizard costume, but in ordinary clothes. He asked why I hadn't gone to the castle yet, and I just replied I was on my way. As we both walked away from the inn, I asked what he was doing here. His pace slowed slightly, and he let out a small sigh. He had managed to convince the other players to finally turn on Ulsic, but not the way he had wanted to. Ulsic had been giving a speech of the value of loyalty, and when Vlaine had interrupted him to argue, Ulsic lost his temper. He started to yell at Vane, and when he saw that Vlaine wasn't particularly intimidated, Ulsic used an instant kill spell on him. Vlaine regretted the passing of the NPC known as Thaladeus Norwinter, but the old wizard's death wasn't in vain. The other players needed no other reason to exile him from the town and throw Ulsic to the monster. Even most of the ones who had supported Ulsic saw the change in times, abandoning their old master in order to side with the majority. Ulsic's position within the town was destroyed. His reputation reigned. All he had left was whatever fills he managed to bring with him, and himself alone. If we managed to defeat them, we would finally be finished. Uncertainty slowing me down, but hope moving me forward. I walked towards what could be my final battle. Okay guys, so what do you think of the story so far? I know, I know, another cliffhanger, but we'll be uploading the next part before Christmas. Tell us what you want to happen to Ulsic. Oh, and... Tell us if you want us to continue with the next thread of LARP Camp or go back and redo the first thread because it got took down for copyright issues. And while I'm telling you to do things, like and subscribe, share while you're here. Thanks guys, see you in the next video.